everybody to our uh, online roundtable here on the FLSA overtime regulation changes and um, I want to uh, introduce uh, Phil Owenby, who many of you may know. Phil's uh, doing some work with me now. So, Phil, thanks for joining us here and offering your, your comments. Thank you, Patrick, and good afternoon, everybody. So, um, got a little bit of background noise there. Not sure where that's coming from. Um, so, I want to, want to roll into our first uh, slide here talk a little bit about um, what we're going to be talking about today. And, uh, you know, the first thing I want to mention is that um, GBN is, is not an authority on FLSA overtime regulations. And, uh, you know, we recommend that everybody be consulting with a human resource professional, you know, a, a labor or, or employment attorney. Uh, hopefully your your club has one. Um, if not, I mean, a lot of clubs don't have human resource professionals on site. Some clubs do, but you know, a lot of times it's left to the uh, some of the other folks at the club. Maybe the golf professional being one of them. So we're we're recommending that everybody um, you know consult with with professionals on this. Um, the purpose of this call is to discuss some of the facts as we know them, share ideas, and raise awareness. And you know, really want to. Uh, make sure that, uh, you know, any questions that you have, please type them in. I won't probably be able to answer them now, but I'm certainly going to do everything I can to, you know, help any of the questions you have be answered. Um, it may not be by me, but it may be by somebody else. But really want to just, you know, maybe hear some of the things you have been doing at your club, uh, you know, kind of to prepare for this and uh, and share those ideas and, you know, really just kind of raise the awareness about the upcoming changes that, that are going on here. I um, want to kind of go over some of the terminology that will be, it'll be kind of come up in the in the conversation here today. Um, some of it might be uh, self-explanatory, but uh, FLSA is the, the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, it establishes minimum wage, overtime pay, record keeping, and, and youth employment standards. And, uh, and this is where some of these changes are being, uh, being made. Um, EAP employees are um, executive, administrative, and professional. It's different categories of, of exempt employees. And um, the golf professional uh, really falls under the executive. Um, each of these, you know, there's different tests that they give to employees to, to determine if they're, they're exempt. And uh, the golf professional, I think, actually falls under the executive. And we'll talk about some of the, some of the things there that um, need, to, need to be met. Um, these exempt tests that need to be met for the EAP employees. There's a, a salary basis test. So, you know, are you paying somebody a salary? It, you know, does it, are they being paid regularly the same amount that doesn't fluctuate, um, you know, with performance? That's the salary basis test. Uh, the salary level test is some of the changes that are happening here. You know, the salary level, and we'll talk about that, was at a certain amount. Now it's being raised um, for the, uh, uh, the minimum amount to be to be met, and then there's what they call a duties test, which we are gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about. You know what these duties are um, that that would qualify somebody into being exempt, uh, and then non-exempt. You know what does it mean to be non-exempt? Um, so some of the terminology that we're gonna talk about here today. Um, you know, so what we know about these changes, uh, the salary level test. So this is where. Uh, this amount is being raised on a per week or an annual basis from 455 per week to 913 per week or annually 23,660 to 47,476 annually. So as of December 1st, that's the, um, you know, the, the proposal and, or, or that, that it will be the change to this 47,476. Um, Right now, that's uh, automatically going to be adjusted every three years to be maintained at the 40th percentile of full-time salaried workers in the lowest income region. So that means that they're going to, you know, reset that um, that salary level test every three years. Um, and and Phil, correct me if I'm wrong, but what we we were listening to a webinar actually right before we got on this one uh, about this, and it, it sounded like maybe this was going to be challenged. 
Um, I don't know if you caught that on their on that webinar, but that they, somebody's you know got a proposal in that's going to be challenging this. Did you catch that? I did catch that. They said that uh, not only going to be challenged in terms of whether it's going to be enacted on December first or not, which the gentleman running that uh, webinar indicated that he thought that was very unlikely that it would be that. But there was also a uh, bill that's already on the Congress, on the floor of Congress right now to uh, actually delay the implementation. Mm -hmm. It could be implemented over, I think the explanation that it could be implemented over a three-year period. But right. he said also that he felt like that that was highly unlikely. Highly unlikely that it would be implemented over a three-year period? That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. So we need we need to be prepared that it's going to be December one is what you're saying, or what he was saying. Yeah, that's what he was saying. Correct. Yeah. So this is you know some of the some of the changes. Obviously the salary level test. That's a you know a pretty substantial increase there. Um, no changes to the duties test, which we're going to talk a little bit about here. What that what that really means. Um, you know their implementation. You know it's likely that it's going to occur over a certain period of time, but you know, not sure where that is. You know, again, these are we're not the expert. We're just kind of um, talking a little bit about some of the things we've been hearing. Uh, you know, this is new. The, uh, they're going to allow employers to count uh, bonuses and incentive payments. Um, which, Phil, I'm, I'm, I'm think I'm correct in saying that the um, lessons would be counted into bonus and incentive payments. Is that is that what we were understanding? That's the way we understand it at this point. Yes. Right. So of that. Of that salary level, 47,476, 10% of that can be met through either bonuses, incentive payments, and, and I believe lessons would be included in that. So, um, you know, something to consider there. And then, you know, set to, to take effect on December 1st of this year, not too far off. So this is uh, some of the some of the things is, that we know, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go. Talk, you wanted to hit on exempt and non-exempt, and I think this is, to me, as I'm thinking about this, um, you know, or have been thinking about it more. This is, you know, seems to be a big, um, a, a big crux of the issue here is whether, you know, who's exempt, who's not exempt. So, exempt employees are excluded from minimum wage and overtime regulations. Employers must pay them a salary. Um, hours worked uh, are not required to be tracked. Um, FLSA does not limit the amount of hours that, that somebody could work in, the, in that time frame. Um, it's just asterisks here. Some exempt employees have rights under other laws um, or, or employment policies or contracts. So just some, you know, there are some other things to consider. Um, but these are some of the basics of being exempt. Non-exempt employees, they, they need to be paid at least the federal minimum wage. Um, and obviously the, some of the states have different minimum wages as well. So we need to be aware of what those are. Um, and they must be given overtime pay for any hours worked over uh, 40 hours in a week. Um, the duties test, this is, uh, you know, when you, when you look at exempt and non-exempt, and we go back to the slide earlier about the uh, EAP employees and executive, these are really the duties that, are, that need to be met for the executive I mean, these are some, you know, a snapshot of some of the duties that need to be met. So, regularly supervises two or more other employees, has management as primary duty of the position, interviewing, selecting, and training, setting rates of pay and hours worked, appraising productivity, handling employee grievances or complaints, planning budgets for work, providing for safety and security of the workplace, has input into job status of other employees, hiring, firing, promotions, or assignments. Um, so these are not all of the duties, but these, you know, kind of a snapshot that I thought was uh, relevant to thinking about a golf professional and whether a whether a golf professional is exempt under the exempt and non-exempt. Are these duties met? So you've got the three tests: the salary level, the sa the salary basis, the salary level, and the duties test. So are these all being met? by the golf professionals at the club. Um, so, you know, that leads me to the question, and, and, and Phil and I, as we were talking about, should the assistant, should your assistant golf professionals be exempt? Um, you know, I, I was at a club that several years ago, um, through an internal audit 
of the club decided to change the assistant golf professionals from exempt to non-exempt because they didn't feel like that these uh, duties were being met by the assistants at that club. So I, I don't know this for a fact, but um, Phil, you know, you can chime in here, but uh, I'm, I think that maybe there's assistant professionals that are listed as, as exempt that may really be non-exempt. Um, in your experience, you think that's the case? Yeah, I think that I think you're exactly right. I think the key uh, bullet point there is that third one uh, about the hiring, firing, promotions, and assignments. In a lot of cases, uh, you know, that particular responsibility does not fall upon the assistant professionals. At least, not all assistant professionals. And so, I think that uh, you know what we're listening to and what we're seeing is that that's going to be a, a primary uh, you know, exempt key or question that's going to be asked about that, uh, you know, golf professional, assistant professional, and consequently exempt employee. Yes. So, you know, should should your assistant golf professional be exempt? I think that's a question that, you know, every club should be should be thinking about here because that's, um, you know, if they're if they're currently exempt and they're not meeting the uh, the salary level test, and they, if they're going to remain exempt, they're going to need to meet that salary level uh, test. So, you know, that's something to consider. Um, you know, and, and if they're not exempt, or if you, if you change them from exempt to non-exempt, how are they going to be compensated? And, um, you know, the one thing that we've been looking into, and some of you may be aware of, is what they call the fluctuating work week option. And, um, you know, I've actually, I've been compensated this way and in the club I was at um, although I wasn't the assistant professional a couple of years ago when they made this change that's what they 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 switched when they switched them from exempt to non-exempt they went to this fluctuating work week option which um, you know and, and some of the highlights of that are you know some of you might know it is referred to as halftime or though it's not politically correct Chinese overtime uh, some people call it uh, you do have a fixed salary for 40 hours, so um, you know it's it's different than paying somebody a straight hourly rate and then paying them time and a half because they are, you know, quote unquote, guaranteed a salary for 40 hours, um, you know, over the year. Whether they work 40 or not, they might work 30. They're still going to get paid for 40, but there's a, a different way to to compensate them on their overtime. Uh, and in some of the not to get too much into it, but I'm going to be forwarding a document that does explain this more in detail. Um, they take the salary divided by the actual hours worked. That can't be less than the minimum wage, whether it's your state minimum wage or federal minimum wage. Uh, the overtime pay rates uh, would, would not be less than one half of the hourly rate. And, and the, you'll see this in this calculation of when I forge you this document and how they get there um, is it, essentially it's you're having uh, the hourly rate, not it's not time and a half. So, uh, you know, there's there's advantages to this. Um, I think from a club standpoint, you know, this this could be potentially be a, a solution. Uh, there are some states where this is not uh, allowed, from my understanding. So you just want to make sure. Obviously, again, uh, going back to your HR professional or your 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 labor or employee uh, attorneys will be able to tell you this. Uh, so. It, some other keys here, divide the number of hours worked into the salary for the hourly rate, and then the payment for overtime hours is at one half that rate. Uh, so again, you know, different than, you know, paying somebody an hourly rate and paying them time and a half, obviously they work 30 hours a week, they're going to be paid for 30 hours a week. Under this fluctuating work week option, they, they're guaranteed to be paid for the, for the 40 hours um, with that salary. So this is something you know, I think needs to be looked at. Um, uh, Phil, did I cut, catch everything that we kind of talked about on that, the, the fluctuating work week? Yeah, I think you did. I think it's just realistically, it's just more of an opportunity. I think it's more of a, a system that can be used where it's easily or I guess easier to plan uh, for the fluctuating hours that a assistant golf professional is used on a work in a 12-month period. You're going to find times of the year where they're not necessarily going to work 40 hours. You're going to find times of the year where they may work more than 40 hours. So this way is a, an opportunity to plan for that. Uh, you know that that assistant 
professional still making a, a certainly weekly rate, wage, but uh, the overtime hours are, are paid at one half versus the time and a half. So it's a better way to plan, I think, from a financial standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, you would I would think from from an employee standpoint as well. You know, they they can plan their sure. their family budget or whatever, uh, knowing that there's a there's a fixed amount there. Um, you know, so the uh, you know the thing the the thing to consider, and you know, I had an email from from a GBN member who mentioned this to me earlier today. Couldn't be on the call, but uh, that it was you know really uh, paying a, a, an assistant the hourly rate, and then the the time and a half plus figuring in the lessons was really a challenge for him, where he was having to um, you know really limit them to to forty hours, and and obviously the the issues that come up with that where you know you're you're trying to maintain the level of service and the having the staff there but you know you have the challenges of of the overtime payment so um, you know the you still would have that with the fluctuating work week where the lesson amount would need to be um, you know figured in there but uh, I you know I think with this half time that that makes it so I think a little more of a a little easier to to do so something to consider here in, in this uh, US wage and hour overtime compensation regulations document I'll be forwarding to everybody if you google it you might be able to to come across it but um, um, I am gonna uh, have that up and, and have it on the website as well um, and then you would just go to pages 8 and 9 it kind of describes how that how that works um, so you know it's we kind of went through this and, and hit some of the, the highlights and, you know, again, hopefully answering some questions or raising some of the awareness about this. I mean, I've had, I've had several phone calls from, from guys that, you know, really wasn't even on the radar, you know, what is this all about? And, you know, it's, it's sneaking up on everybody a little bit and, you know, the, the more you can do to get out in front of it, you know, take the time to talk to the HR professionals and the, uh, um, and the attorneys about this to make sure that you're going to be in compliance. But, you know, so we're recommending, you know, continue to research all the options with these professionals and, and attorneys and whatever, whoever that person is at your club, um, you know, communicate with your staff. You know, I think that's going to be huge, uh, letting them know, because obviously it's going to affect them, you know, one way or another. I mean, it's, something's going to change, you know, right, Phil? I mean, it's going to, it's, it's going to change one, one way or another. And, um, you know, I think the more you can communicate with them, and Phil, you were, I think you had a discussion with uh, with a general manager the other day who was kind of asking your, some of your advice on this, and, and I'm, I'm trying to think how you were describing it, but, you know, really, hey, we're a team, right? And that's the way you have to look at it. You have to look at it from the standpoint that you're going to be up front. You have to communicate this. I mean, this is, it, it, it's evidently by everything we're seeing and all of the research that we've done is that, you know, this is going to happen. December 1st is going to come and this is going to be enacted and so I think that everybody needs to be aware that uh, you have to be planning for that and now's the time to do that and one of the predominant things that you want to get ahead of is communicating this with your team and communicating it from the standpoint that we are a team we are going to work on this together you know it is important that we maintain the level of hospitality and level of service that we offer and in order to do that we have to make sure that we're communicating, we're on the same page in terms of, of how you're going to be compensated and, and how it's going to comply with the rules and regulations that are going to be put forth, that, that uh, the regulations that everyone's going to have to follow. And so I think that that's a key element of this if you, you know, spend all your time and effort trying to learn what you can but not communicating it with your team, they're going to be hit blindsided to a certain extent and they're going to have more questions than they are going to be answers. So I think the, the the sooner you get on top of it with your team, the better off you're going to be. Absolutely. And we, we have had some, some questions that have been typed in. I'm going to be reading those here momentarily after I um, finish here. So um, just want to, uh, uh, you know, just stressing here that we're not the authority on this and, and really making sure that you guys go to uh, – go to who you need to talk to about this and, and the purpose of this was just to share some ideas and raise awareness. So, um, you know, some of the questions that came in here, um, I'll read a couple of them here. So, um, somebody had a question. So, you're saying that exempt employees do not need to be paid the new amounts. That, that's, no, exempt employees will need to be paid um, 
at the threshold. That's that's what that is. Non-exempt um, are not considered. Uh, Non-exempt employees do not need to be paid at the the new threshold. So it's for exempt employees. Um, uh, Hal Jacobs was wondering what lessons be on the clock. Uh, Phil, we understand that that you need to be on the clock, right? And and then those amounts That's correct. need to be, cons you know, they would be figured into you know your your hourly rate essentially. Um, that's so correct. That, yeah. So that's something to consider. You know, when you have an assistant that's uh, working 50 hours a week and he's going to teach 10 hours, uh, you know, during those 50 hours, that you know the amounts that he's um, teaching uh, are technically supposed to be considered into his, um, you know, to figure into his his overtime rate. And this is the email I received earlier today. It was, you know, GBN member just he keeps his assistance at 40 hours a week, which, you know, obviously we all know that that's a, that's a short week, right? So, right. Um, you know, just something to, something to, questions to uh, ask your, whoever your, your uh, professional is at your club. Um, Patrick, before you go yeah. further to the next one, to go back to that first question about the exempt, you know, the exempt uh, staff person will need to be paid at least at the threshold of that 47000 change, whatever it is. But the non-exempt will not have to be paid at that threshold, but will have to meet the minimum wage, hourly minimum wage. Right. Yeah, that's, and the, that's where the yeah, that's where the question comes in when we start talking about lessons and, and other things and, and determining what that actually hourly rate is. Right. Right. I, uh, so if you were to work, uh, I mean, for an example, I mean, if you work, somebody works, you know, 70, 80 hours in a week and your, um, your, your salary level, you know, if that were the salary level divided by the 80 hours they worked, if they were to go below either the federal or your state minimum wage, you, you, you'd have some, some issues. So those are just things to consider as you, as you're, potentially making a change from somebody from exempt to non-exempt and you're going to move them, you know, from a straight salary to, uh, you know, potentially a fluctuating work week or hourly with overtime um, with, with time and a half. Um, you know, you need to you need to think about that. So, um, and that's documented, that's documented very clearly too in, in that uh, information that you mentioned on the previous slide that, that can be referenced uh, on the FSLA that, you know, where you can read research those two pages in that document that really, uh, I think, explains it very well. Yeah, the uh, wage and hour yeah. overtime compensation regulations, yeah. which, again, we'll, uh, we'll get recommend to. recommend you research in that. Yes. Um, so we had a question, uh, Tom Dyer, uh, discuss any knowledge of how aggressively feds will be regulating caddies' independent contractor status. We all need to hire a caddy management company to avoid a problem. Um, Phil, you want to? Yeah. What do you What do you think about that, Phil? Uh, I wish we could answer that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that that's a that's a key question. I think that we have too is, uh, and we talked about that earlier. You know, anybody that's going to be uh, working at that at that level and and be classified as such as an outside contractor. Um, you know, where does that fit and you know, I, I think that that is truly a question that really needs to be vetted with uh, an HR professional and probably more importantly a, a labor attorney uh, because I think that the uh, during the research that we've done so far, you know, within the regulations, we really haven't found any information that specifically addresses that at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that doesn't mean you can't still have outside you know, labor uh, contractors, but it, it does mean that I think it's going to be important to really to see where they fall in terms of the, we we'll go back to the specific duties and how that fits. You know, if they're being used for any purpose other than what they're uh, doing, for example, if they're just caddying, um, you know, that's one thing. If they're caddying and providing some services within your outside services or uh, you know, whatever capacity at the club, you know, that may present an issue. It would be worthwhile to find out exactly in your state exactly what that state regulation is as well as the federal regulation.
good question. It's a really good question. Yeah, it's a great um, question. So we got another one from uh, Nick Muller. Thoughts on paying minimum wage and then doing monthly performance bonuses to make up the difference in what their current salary is today. Um, you definitely do that. Right. Uh, to, it's a uh, has to fall within that ten percent range. Yeah. So their salary has to be what was the number, Patrick? Forty two and some change, I think you said. Right. But uh, so Nick, what you're saying here, thoughts on paying minimum wage and then doing monthly performance bonuses to make up for the difference in what their current salary is today. Um, so you're saying move them, move them to move them to hourly and then try to give them a monthly performance bonus. Yeah, I mean that there's I, Phil, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, if they're if they're not, they would be moving from exempt to non-exempt. So you'd be paying them hourly. Right be paying them whatever hourly rate and then you're paying them a, a bonus to to make up what they were last year. Um, I I don't don't think there's any anything wrong with that. Do you feel? Not on the surface. No, not on the surface. I, again I would just couch it from the standpoint of you know, making sure that you uh, confirm that with your you know um, state regulations through an attorney and or your HR professionals. Yeah. And we, um, we, we did okay. have, uh, I was just going to uh, bring up. That's just being creative. Yeah. And I Which think that's, I think a lot of guys are going to be that way. Absolutely. I think that's going to have to happen. And we were talking to a uh, uh, club out in Texas. They were, you know, considering um, basically moving all of their assistants to meet this, the salary threshold. Um, and then I think what they were going to be doing was pooling their, their, their clinic income and then, um, you know, maybe paying them a bonus uh, out that way or uh, somehow it was the, the, whatever they were doing from their lesson clinic standpoint was going to be pooled and then they were going to raise their salary and then, you know, try to make it so they weren't um, right. necessarily going to be losing anything um, from one year to, to the next, from 15 to Yeah, a little from different 16, from 17. what... Uh, Nick was asking because Nick was yeah. asking about you know, taking someone to a or taking his assistant professional to a hourly rate, hourly employee, and non-exempt. Where out, out there, what uh, they were uh, planning to do, at least trying to get creative on, was to keep as as many, if not all, their assistants at the salaried uh, or exempt level, um, and then you know work towards that minimum salary which again is like 42,000 some change and then you're uh, allowed to, to bonus up to 10% which would get you to the threshold of 47,000. Right. And that way they were going to try to do that was to take all lessons that were given by the assistants and clinics and pull that into a, a uh, in other words, the club would collect all that and then from that the club would then bonus the assistants based on how they performed. Now that's a creative way and that, that they have not vetted that. They did mention it. They had not vetted it at that point, uh, you know, with their, uh, that's a discussion with their HR people, but they had not vetted it at the state level or the federal level to yeah. see if it actually did qualify. But that's a, that's a great creative way to think about it. Yeah. And it also creates that team concept that you're hoping to continue to have within your staff too. Absolutely. Um, so we're uh, talking about uh, uh, the next question here from Phil Anderson was if a golf professional owns a shop and pays all lessons to assistant golf professionals, junior golf clinics, the hours worked at camps, et cetera, handles as an independent contractor, do you have to count the hours towards work week? So pays all lessons to assistant golf professionals. Uh, Not sure I'm completely understanding that question, but um, the hours worked at camps and handles an independent contractor. Do you have to count the hours towards the work week? I, I fill that part it of it. Would depend. Yeah, wouldn't it depend on whether if if that is an assistant pro that's on your on your staff and is being paid a weekly uh, is on a, a weekly hourly or is being paid a salary? Um, I think that. Based on what we're reading, uh, again, and you know, uh, we're being very careful, obviously, to make sure that we couch all this. But um, 
uh, again, I would think that that according to the way we're reading the laws, that that actually would fall within the hourly. You have to compute, compute that within the hourly rate. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're salaried and exempt employee, then I think it would fall into the discussion of is their salary, you know, and bonuses, bonuses which include, again would include the lessons. Does that reach those criteria? Right within the regulations. Uh, so, Phil, I think you know, just something you probably want to um, look into further with with people closer to home. There, you know, your your HR or your your attorneys. Um, it's a good good question. Um, so, if you if you keep assistants at forty hours, can you have them teach not on the clock? Um, That's what we just heard in that previous webinar we listened to. Mm -hmm. And according to what they were saying is that you you cannot. Right. Hal, that's I what think they were saying, but that's, yeah. that's not necessarily. Yeah. You know, again, you know, great great question. Just probably one you wanna you wanna vet out and make sure that you're 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 covered under that. Um, if an assistant is currently salaried and playing in a section or chapter event with club members, can tournament winnings be counted towards that salary level? Good question. Uh, you know, that that's uh, I don't have an answer for that, Jeff. I don't think we do. Um, Non-discretionary bonus and incentive payments. Um, you know, hate to say one way or another, Jeff. Uh, I, I think that's a, a good question. You just want to take to somebody that's uh, a professional. But a great question. Um, Basic question there, I think, is that when you know, are they are they actually uh, working on the clock, if you will? Are they is that part of their activities associated with the club? And you know, what's the proof that you have to have to to make that happen? Because if it is something to do very different from the depend the contractor question, you know, if if it can be proven that it's not part of their time, it's actually their time, not the club's time, to do that. And I'm not sure it would be affected based mm -hmm. on the laws as, as regulations as we read them. Yeah, but but you know we're not the ones interpreting it. Right. So it's a good question. Um, it is a great something, question. Something for everybody to think about. There. Uh, had another question here for exempt employees at a seasonal club. How do you calculate what the pay floor would be? Would you have to divide the 47 salary by the months worked at the club, and would that salary be paid? Um, I think. Parker, what, what the, the question you're asking is why they break it down to a weekly amount as well, because um, they, they offer it as a weekly and an annual amount. So I, I don't know the exact answer, but I'm assuming that's, um, you know, Phil, as you read that question, um, I'm thinking it goes yep. back to what that weekly amount is Great. going from, I think it was yes. 4, 455 to 913 or something like that. Right, 913. A week, and I think that that's the way they would look at it, and that's the reason why they broke it into to weekly too, because you may be paying somebody on the annualized salary that's that's greater than the forty-seven thousand. In which case, I think you would you would uh, comply. Yeah. Um. So good, good question. Um. Justin Lawson is only is it only two options for non-exempt fluctuating and hourly plus overtime? Can you give more examples for fluctuating work week compensation models? Um, the, the, so as we understand it, Justin, that when you're non-exempt, you, you know, the big difference is that uh, you, uh, you have to be compensated for overtime. You know, so in, in hourly time and a half, uh, or um, yeah, hour, if you're paid an hourly rate, you work over 40 hours, you receive time and a half. Um, the fluctuating work week, which is probably not as well known, um, is just a different way of, uh, of compensating them. Um, those are the two ways, Phil, that I know of um, for non-exempt employees. I don't know that there's any other ways, but, uh, but those are the two that we know of, and I think it's uh, um, a matter of you know, how you're going to get there. You know, are you going to... Yeah, and it's a, it's a terrific example, again, in, in the um, 
U.S. wage and hour overtime compensation regulations that we've referenced here on the fluctuating hours where it goes into uh, an employee that is set at a weekly salary. I think the number was 400 so that's $10 an hour. And they gave an example of that, that employee works, you know, 37 hours one week, 46 hours the next week, 28 hours, and then 40 two hours, something like that, and they go through that in exactly the amounts that they should be paid on each week, and, and the focus on that is that if they only work, if they work less than 40 hours, they still get their $400, because that's what the fluctuating work week's all about, and that's why you can, can utilize it. If they don't work their 40, they still get paid that $400, which is, is what you've said that that's what it's going to be. But the hours that they work above that 40, they only get paid half time. So the basis being is that they've already, they're already going to get paid if they work 42 hours. They get paid 42 hours at the $10 rate, and then they only get $5 an hour for the additional. Yeah. Um, so it's like what Patrick is showing right now. Um, you know, it goes through that, and it's pretty self-explanatory, and the math is done that's, that makes sense. Um, Again, the I think the advantage here is, like we mentioned earlier, the advantage here is the planning process. Yeah, uh, with people, with staff members that you know are going to work more than forty some weeks of the year and are going to work less than forty on other weeks of the year. Um, so good, uh, you know, good question there. Um, would a seasonal employee? someone who works less than 28 weeks at your facility still need to hit the federal salary minimum. So, um, Nathaniel, I think uh, a seasonal employee, it, it, would they need, they, they're going to need to meet the, the federal salary minimum if they're exempt and, and on, on salary. So that weekly amount, if they're, you know, if they're, if the club is, designating them as exempt, then they're going to need to meet that um, that threshold. So good question, but I, I think it all comes back to just whether you're exempt or non-exempt and, you know, are you meeting the, the salary the salary basis, the salary level, and the um, the duties test. And these are, those are the things I think that clubs really need to be, really need to be looking at. Um, David Van Hoffman, from the simplest standpoint, does less in revenue for an assistant that gets paid to him count toward the salary threshold. So our understanding on that, David, is, uh, again, back that, they're allowing 10% of that, of that threshold, the salary threshold at 47, you know, whatever that is, 10% of that can be what they call non-discretionary bonuses and incentive payments. So whether you make, you know, Say you know, for example, if if um, you know, if, if you're salaried at thirty, you know, thirty thousand, and you make thirty thousand in lessons, they're only going to allow you to make ten percent. They're only going to allow you to take ten percent of that thirty thousand, so three thousand, to get you to that threshold, and that doesn't get you to the threshold. So, the combination of those two, they're only allowing ten percent of that forty-seven thousand to be from that non-discretionary bonus, as we understand it. So. You know, the salary therefore for would need to be, you know, forty-two thousand or forty-three thousand, and then any, any you know, ten percent of the bonuses can get you to that that threshold. Um, with the question that was just asked, what about someone that is an assistant golf professional and also a subcontracted caddy? Um, that's a, that's a good question. You know. Um, I feel I think you were touching on that, right? Yeah. About I, def I definitely would be communicating with um, you know uh, HR person and or labor attorney on that one. Yeah, yeah. I don't think uh, I don't think that's. Because I think it, the problem may be there is that if they may all be going out for a couple of loops a week, but uh, let's call it four hour loops. You know that that may be eight hours that you have to use within the forty hours. Or it becomes overtime pay, and then the amount that they get paid, you know, comes into the calculation. We're not totally sure, and you know, don't take that as being, you know, an absolute because we don't know. 
Yeah. Um, but it, it's certainly certainly see that, and I think there are a lot of clubs that, that do that, that have caddy programs. Um, so I definitely think that that's a great question and something that just needs to be vetted. And I, and I think that some states will do it differently than others. Uh, you know, another comment that I'll add that uh, question had been asked, but the difference between, you know, the federal law is the federal law, but each state has an opportunity to make their laws accordingly, obviously. And um, I was just reading something before we came came along here, and that uh, it was actually in the food and beverage document. But the food and beverage document was talking about um, the minimum wage for uh, just regular laborers within the food and beverage. And some states, for example, um, New York is going to, and minimum wage is going to go to fifteen dollars an hour beginning in two thousand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in other states like California is going to do the same thing, but they're not going to go until 2021. So they're going to stay with the federal number until then. But I think each state can be different. And, you know, the previous webinar we were listening to as well, Patrick, you know, they were, they were highlighting a particular situation in Indiana, in Indiana state uh, laws. So, mm -hmm. you know, every state's going to be different. So, you know, just make sure that you double check within the state government, not just the federal government, because there may be some different regulations there that you fall under that other guys across the country just don't. Um, so uh, another question here, any clubs thinking about employing assistants and sharing them with another club, in theory working 35, 40 hours at one club, 20, 30 in another, could these be a best practice? Um, I mean, I, I think it's a a great concept. Uh, I don't know, you know, how that would be handled from, you know, the the standpoint of the FLSA and how that would how that would fit in. Uh, Phil Phil's got some great questions, <laughs> ones that just above our our pay grade. I think, um, you know, it's definitely worth looking into. Uh, Phil, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, on the surface, it would sound like it. You know, that's two different two different jobs. Mm -hmm. It would sound like, you know, he could work 40 hours at one club and 40 hours at another club. That's two different entities on the surface, but it's the same person. So, um, you know, I, I think on the surface, my, my reaction would be that everything would be okay there. Mm -hmm. But, again, I'm not the expert in that. And uh, sometimes doing as much research as we've done, it causes more problems than it does helpful. But um, I, I truly believe that from the way I look at it, in that particular situation, if uh, the system pro was working 30 hours at one place and went over and worked 25 at another, it would appear to me that he'd be a, you know, classified as a part-time person in both places. But that doesn't necessarily mean the case. And again, I would just reiterate that it may be a different law within the state, not necessarily just the federal law that would apply. Right. Um, so Parker goes on to ask a question about what I had highlighted up there. Doesn't $6 an hour overtime fall below the federal minimum wage? Didn't it say you could not pay less than this? Yeah, that's. Uh, let me see if I can pull that back up. Um, under this example here. Yeah, it, it depends on when this example was was made. I mean, it could have been before the federal minimum wage. Um, I, I wouldn't pay as much attention to what the numbers are here as what the um, you know the the verbiage of it saying that you can't go below the the minimum because the minimum wage is it could be some states are the same as federal, some are you know different than and this has changed a good bit. I'd, it's a great question, Parker. But um, again, you're going to want to talk to uh, to somebody. It does state that you can't, you know, you cannot be below the minimum wage of whatever that state is is recognizing. So, you know, this example wouldn't necessarily fit into each of them. Um, and it could have been that this example was was done before the federal minimum wage has changed. But uh, good good question. I, I would look into that further. Um, let's see here. How exactly does the overtime calculation work, including lessons for non-exempt employees? Does it fluctuate based on lessons given? Good, good question, Nick. Um, I'm going to again fall back on talk to somebody there. But our 
understanding is is that, um, and Phil, correct me if I'm wrong, but let's say you have a an hourly, non-exempt hourly employee who works um, 50 hours a week, and he makes you know, it's whatever his hourly rate is. You would add in whatever that is his 40 hours a week at his hourly rate plus whatever he made in lessons. So I don't think it has not not as much on based on lessons given, but on how much he made. Um, and let's say that's whatever amount that is, you would add that to what he made for 40 hours, and then you would come up with an hourly rate. That would really be his true hourly rate, and then you would have to pay time and a half on that. And that's why, you know, that that's not very appealing for, for clubs, I imagine. Would you say, Phil? I'd agree, and I think the way uh, Nick uh, posed the question, too, is that, you know, a different amount each week with lessons, it may be, you know, a higher amount one week and lower amount the next and so forth, and I, and I think it does fluctuate based on the way we read it, based on the amount of dollars. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he could give zero lessons in one week, and then he gives, you know, whatever amount the next week. So, yeah, that, that would fluctuate, but it would be... Um, right the way we understand it would be on a week to week basis. Yeah. So, so uh, I think the key is, you know, with all these questions which are terrific questions, um, is that, you know, it, the rules are what they are and they they're going to be what they are as of December 1. And I think, you know, it gives us the opportunity now to really be uh, in the in the benefit of this is just really providing the information as we know it and as we've researched it. Um, and, and obviously it could be a resource for anybody listening as well as other GBM members to, to talk about it. But I think that um, it, it's really going to be important to try to be as creative as you can in any individual situations that you have, whether independent contractors or you know, whether they should be exempt or non-exempt, uh, which is a great idea and, and a, like you say, a best practice about you know, sharing a, an assistant professional working at a couple of different clubs. I mean, creativity is going to be a key here. Uh, in, in determining what's going to be best for the individual situation. And I think the more communication we can have uh, with each other and you know, finding out what, what best situations and sharing those situations and how you may have tried to uh, you know, accommodate your situation with your club and with your team, it's going to be important for us to know that too. Um, you know, we're going to continue to reach out and continue to, to research it because this is really important. It's Absolutely. not only important for the financial viability of the clubs, it's very important for the continuing the level of service that everybody wants to provide at the clubs. Right, and, you know, we were talking about this earlier, Phil. I mean, the, you know, this could, uh, I mean, it's important for the development of the staff, right? Because, you know, you might be, you could potentially be losing opportunities, um, you know, for for the, the entry-level staff. I mean, there could be positions that, that change from, an entry level position to now that's a part time position being filled by two people and you know that that could really change how uh, assistant golf professionals are able to develop themselves so I mean there's a lot of obviously ramifications we had a couple more um, um, one more thing from Phil uh, would travel time to P PGA Junior League matches as a captain be considered on the clock or traveling with members on a golf trip work Seem, or, uh, as work um, seem like some gray areas. I agree, Phil. <laughs> some great question. A lot, lot of gray areas. It's a great question. Um, one that uh, I, I don't necessarily have an answer to right now. So uh, hopefully uh, you've got somebody there that can can help you at your club. Um, so you know, I appreciate everybody's questions. That's awesome. Good stuff there. I mean, you know, really wanted. You know, the real main purpose of this was to you know hopefully raise the awareness. Um, you know, get get people talking about it. Get get you guys and and, and uh, ladies out in front of it. Um, you know, so if we can be a resource in any way, but um, but really can't stress enough to to talk to somebody uh, that's an expert or that has authority in this field and um, try to get in front of it. You know, and, and communicate with your staff on you know what you're going to be doing. So, Phil, uh, uh, appreciate you being here with us and um, everybody Absolutely. on the call. Thanks for, uh, thanks for your time and look forward to talking to everybody again soon.